Good morning and good afternoon to everyone who's listening in on the webinar today. Thanks for joining us. It's uh, good to see uh, a good large number of you signing up and registering for the webinar today. Um, we've got uh, a great session coming up with some uh, guests who we've had before, who I'm sure will give us lots of insights that uh, uh, you're going to really enjoy. Our topic today is the new normal, managing uncertainty. Um, we keep trying not to go back to 2019 and, and look back. And uh, so today we're really focusing on uh, hopefully this year, the year that's just come to an end, and 2023, what we can expect for the next year. And you know, much as we would like to think everything's going back to how it used to be, that certainly isn't the case. We've got uh, lots of things we're still grappling with and uh, not least economic uncertainty over the year ahead. So um, without much ado, we will start. Um, the topics we're looking at today, as I say, yeah, going back over the last year, uh, what's changed and what we can expect for 2023. And with us today, um, we've got John Grant, as always. Welcome, John. Hi Becca, hi everyone, good to be good. here. Good, your Christmas jumper, glad to see that, we need it here in the UK, Hello. it's cold isn't it? Yeah exactly, and look I'm surrounded by people who've just dressed in civilian clothing, it's not fair, you know, I feel I feel I'm lonely, it's going to be a bar humbug Christmas. <laughs> um, we've also got Gary, welcome back Gary, and uh, I know you're normally based in Kuala Lumpur, but you're, you're actually just up the road from me today in Oxford aren't you? Yeah, good morning, Becca. Good morning, John and Julian. Yeah, I am not not far from you. Uh, I'm back in Oxford. Been back for a week now. It's been probably the coldest week of the year, hasn't it, Becca? So, yeah, yeah. I didn't bother to I didn't bother to have jet lag this time. I've just been too cold. <laughs> and Julian, um, you're you're in uh, uh, in Delhi, I believe, aren't you? Thank you for coming back and joining us again today. Julian is Chief Marketing Officer at GMR. Yeah, good morning. It's uh, positively chilly, 24 degrees over here in Delhi. <laughs> no Christmas jumper for you then? No, no, although I'm coming back to the UK on Saturday, so I'm bracing myself for the cold when I get there. <laughs> yeah, for airport, our experience of airports the last week has, uh, has not, not been great, so brace yourself for the cold and the uh, airport experience. Yeah. Okay, let's, um, let's make a start. Um, Global capacity, John, we usually start with you, don't we, talking about where we're at with global capacity. So here we've got uh, the, the main chart is, is global capacity on the, on the left and right. We've broken out domestic and international capacity. Yeah. Um, where do we end this year? Uh, we end this year at about 4.74 billion seats, um, which is going to be about 12% down on uh, 2019. Um, but is a dramatic 30% improvement on last year, so that's good. Um, what we're seeing though is we are, notwithstanding um, some events in China this week, we seem to be stuck at around this 88% of pre-pandemic capacity, um, and that stretches through into the first quarter of next year as well. Uh, first quarter of next year, we currently stand at 7% less capacity than uh, 2019, but allowing for the fact that you know airlines will be shaking their networks down, dropping capacity between now and the end of March, I'm pretty confident that will that will again end up at about 88%. Um, the good news on that, of course, is that it will be uh, as we spoke about last month. Um, there will be capacity discipline because there just isn't any way to get more capacity into the systems at the moment. <clears throat> we have challenges with resources still not just people, aircraft, spare parts, <coughs> uh, strikes, industrial action, call it what you will. <coughs> so generally I think we're, um, you know, we're, we're just treading water, Becca, we're just treading water. Domestic is slightly stronger, of course, um, off the base of China having flipped all its capacity uh, back into a domestic market. That increased by 30% last week as they put another 3 million seats uh, back in as lockdown restrictions eased, uh, which is good news, um, and also shows how quickly capacity can change in that market. But it's the international segment that we're really struggling with, and for, for many airlines, uh, that international segment is the higher yielding part of their business that is profitable. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a tough first quarter of next year, I think. It's, um, you know, it's not going to be easy. Um, Hopefully in the next couple of weeks, load factors will be really high um, and airlines will operate uh, good um, on-time performance levels. 
but we need the weather to improve in Europe because it has devastated um, most of the UK airports in the last three days with cancellations, lack of people to de-ice aircraft, no buses um, on the ramp to drive um, or drivers to take people to and from remotely parked aircraft. Um, just goes to show how fragile the recovery still is. Yeah, uh, one thing uh, when we were looking at this slide um, earlier and, and I showed it to Gary to start with and, and he, Gary, you observed something we haven't really pointed out before was that the 2019, the shape of the curve is still very similar to what we've seen. It's just lower in 2022. Um, John, you, you were saying that that's largely a European seasonality yeah. effect that we see, that come what may, whatever the traffic level is, we still see that same pattern. Is, is Absolutely. That... Um, you know, the, perf the perfect scenario for this industry, which will never happen, is about 8%, 8.5% of capacity and demand every month of the year. Um, but there is this thing called seasonality um, that we need to uh, take account of. And in the Northern Hemisphere, and particularly in, in um, Europe, that seasonality is dramatic. You know, for some markets, such as Italy, um, they see about six, maybe seven, six and a half percent of their capacity um, occurring in January and February. And then as the peak season occurs, it goes up to 10 and 11%. So there's this huge seasonality that explains this sort of hump um, that you see in, in each 12-month uh, period. Um, and the difference is that whilst we see that here, we don't see that in many other markets in the world. We do not see that in Latin America. We do not see that in Africa. You know, there are not routes that are added and dropped in May and June that um, occur in Brazil or anything like that. It's a much more stable market. So that phenomena that we see in Europe creates this, this hump in the road. Right. OK, really, really interesting. Let's have a look at a few markets in Asia Pacific. This uh, morning or morning for, for me, certainly in the UK um, webinar, we generally focus on a bit more on Asia Pacific. We leave Europe and, and uh, the Americas and the rest of the world for the afternoon webinar. So what we've got here is um, a selection of uh, six countries in the Asia Pacific region, um, just showing the total capacity for the last four years and just how far off we are the 2019 level still as we end 2022. So interesting, isn't it? China still, I mean, we're showing here 20% down, um, Indonesia 27, Japan 30%. Um, Thailand 50%. I mean, these are these are driven by the international predominantly, aren't they? Uh, yeah, um, particularly in the case of China, I mean, we're at less than 1% of um, total capacity being allocated to international routes at the moment. Uh, India, India, I mean, that's been a really strong domestic recovery and, you know, Julian can speak to, to that in more detail, I'm sure. Um, but that 6% is, is, again, primarily international. And, and Gary, you were saying yesterday, I mean, Thailand at minus 50, people will probably be shocked, but it's it's a reflection of where the market is, isn't it? Yeah, I agree. I think that's the one that for me jumps off the page because in particularly in Southeast Asia, you know, Thailand is seen as the country that's been leading along along with Singapore, that the recovery of the travel industry, particularly inbound tourism. Um, but you look back, John, you look back at the two years before that, 2020, 2021, you can see that the figures were, were really dismal there. And the recovery is relatively slow. And you talk to tour operators in in Thailand right now and they will say there's just not enough flights. We don't really know whether that's just a, a cry for help or whether the demand is actually there. We know that the Chinese market has been closed. The Chinese market accounted for about a quarter of visitors to Thailand in 2019 but that doesn't fully account for the, the, the weakness of demand that we've seen in Thailand this year. That's a bit of a concern. The back end of this year is looking quite strong for Thailand so that you know that hopefully that's a platform for 2023 but as you said earlier Becca you know a really really good point. There are a lot of issues we're still grappling with, and we'll, we'll come to those in Southeast Asia as we go along. But you know, one of those is the fact that uh, demand is still relatively weak compared to before, and the capacities just aren't there. And, and Julian, and, and I guess. Your... Sorry, uh, Julian, I was going to say for India, surely um, Air India's apparent announcement of an order for hundreds of aircraft that's uh, looming will address the six percent reduction there that we see at the moment. 
Yeah, I mean, India, as you say, I mean, ultimately, the domestic recovery is as good as back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, it is in the international piece. Um, and I think some of those markets, the international piece is particularly biased towards China and those elements. Uh, India, though, has huge potential in terms of its opportunity now. As you, we'll probably talk about it in a bit more depth, but Air India is on the cusp of making bigger, big announcements. And the sheer volume of the market in India, all you need to do is add a few extra percentage points to the travelling public there, and those volumes materially shift up. And we've had a few months over the last uh, few where actually we've been ahead of pre-pandemic levels domestically on some of the airports. So I, I think I, I'm at a point now where I think of India as back to norm in terms of domestic. There's just those few international ones now that we just need to try and recover in some way. But that, that's all political element with, with China. But now we're unlocking that, that will hopefully help. Just on Indonesia as well, we have an airport in Madan. And I think the whole Asian uh, market has um, <clears throat> slightly slower to recover just because Asia itself has come back slower. And so Madan has, has had restrictions internationally for a while, same, so has Cebu in the Philippines. But now that they've opened up again earlier this year, they're going to start to come back. So I do feel quite optimistic about the recovery, it's, um, particularly from an Indian point of view. Anyway. And, and look, I, mean, I guess everybody is waiting to see what happens with China. We, we've got a slide coming up about China. But Gary, you're, um, I'm happy to give you a plug. You've got a, a handbook coming out, haven't you, for... Um, that, that will will help people look at how to capture some of that outbound Chinese travel as it as it returns. But it, it's not going to happen fast, is it? And and would these countries probably wouldn't cope if if China came back um, fast? I mean, no, nobody's suggesting it will come back in that way. But um... yeah, well, thanks for the plug. Yeah, we, yeah, Becca, we've got the China Outbound Tourism Handbook 2023 coming out around about Chinese New Year. We've been looking at the travel and, and consumer trends in China over the past three years and looking at really how and that new wave of, of Chinese tourists will be coming back after three years away. Um, you know, what can what can tourism industry expect? But you're right. We don't yet know. What, what's happened in the past week or so is, is phenomenal. The speed of the dismantling of COVID zero in China, um, but how that actually transfers into a uh, the reopening process in 2023, the demand schedule, the air, the airport capacities, uh, how that's actually going to happen, we don't yet know. And you know, it, it's been a damaging three years for the domestic tourism industry. It's been a damaging three years for the Chinese economy. So, you know, I think we have to manage expectations. But of course, there is huge pent up demand. No, there's no question about that. You say that we know that before the pandemic, a, a lot of Chinese travel was um, initiated by people, friends, families, exchanging information, information on social media and, and, and doing their travel research. Is your sense that that is still going on now, even though they haven't been able to travel, that there, there is still that sort of um, evidence of, of social media activity that is going to, is evidence of the pent up demand, I guess? Yeah, absolutely. And even more so, I think, than before. And I think that the social media trends, the social video trends have changed in China. The platforms have changed. The way they're used has changed. The way that the travel industry is trying to uh, use uh, short video apps, particularly to engage with travelers, has changed a great deal in the past three years. And we'll see all that shake down. But yeah, if you're on social media in China right now, you know, there's a huge amount of talk about travel. Uh, and it varies. You know, Some people are still very nervous. Some people are, can't wait to get out. There's, as we've seen in most countries in, of, of Asia over the past year, if they've reopened, uh, you see this huge spectrum of readiness to travel. Uh, and I expect you'll see the same from China. So we've got, uh, we've got a question in, um, Gary. Do, do you expect significant outbound China travel before the first half of 24? So I, I guess you're expecting yeah. a fair bit in 23, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. I think we will, we will start to see the market uh, open up. We will start to see more international flights. I mean, there's two aspects to the opening of China, and I, I don't think we'll ever see a grand opening announcement, but there's two two aspects. One is that there will be more international flights where FITs and VFR will be starting to travel independently again. But the real issue is when China allows uh, group tour bookings to happen again, because not just leisure groups, but also business groups, a huge part of the market. Uh, at the moment, there's no indication of when that will happen, and that will probably be the the back end of the of the opening. Um, but yeah, I think 2023, we will start to see China coming back into, particularly into Asia Pacific, and, and that's a big boost for the industry. Right. Okay, let's have a, a, a look at um, what's happened with Chinese capacity specifically. Uh, the charts on the right here show the domestic capacity, again, 2019 and 2022, and then international, where we can see that 
you know, even though there's not been a formal international opening, the international capacity has just been inching up a, a little bit. Um, and the chart at the bottom just shows where over the last six weeks or so, um, the international capacity that has been added, um, which markets it's been added to, and it's predominantly Northeast Asia, I guess, no surprises there. Um, yeah, you, I mean, you made a good point yesterday when we were talking, John, about the actual value of domestic travel in China is relatively low, I guess, to what some people would expect it to be. Yeah, I mean, if, if you've seen the last uh, quarterly earnings for the big three Chinese airlines, I mean, they're virtually bankrupt. Um, you know, it's uh, it's a desperate situation for them. When you talk to their network planners uh, in these airlines, they're saying, you know, we need to fly international services. That's where the money is. But it's a really good, it's going to be a really careful balancing act because pre-pandemic, you know, then in the last five six years, so perhaps from 2010 onwards, there had been a a dramatic expansion of international services from tier two cities in China to Europe and North America, and they were predominantly operated by Chinese airlines. Most of them were unprofitable, um, and you know. In their on their own right they were killing the airlines um themselves so when we do see the comeback and the recovery i think it's going to be really interesting to see how many of those tier two airports recover their services to tier two airports in europe and north america uh, i think we'll go back to a much more core like operation between the major city pairs um, and for reasons that we'll discuss a bit later on i suspect most of that flying is going to be done by chinese registered airlines um you know this is Apart from Beijing and Shanghai uh, and perhaps Guangzhou, uh, this is not going to be a market that is of much attraction to European carriers. Um, it's a difficult market, you know, it's it's um, predominantly uh, outbound China. Um, there isn't a great deal of inbound leisure. Business demand is, corporate demand is very soft at the moment anyway. Um, we're going to see a recovery, but it's, it's not going to take a full shape uh, as we saw in 2019. Yeah, I agree with that. It's an interesting point as well you make because I think it's going to be quite a while before uh, international inbound to China in terms of tourism, regardless of packages and so forth. Because I just think people are going to be so hesitant to go back to there, given all that's gone on recently, and it'll take some time, I think, for people's confidence that they can travel freely in China to to, to reemerge. So I imagine a lot of the international traffic for China is going to be outbound. That's that would be. Uh, no surprise that that stays that way for at least another sort of six months plus I would Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think also the airlines will be very selective to begin with, the, the, the routes that they choose. You know, that picture you've got yeah. there tells, tells a big story in Northeast Asia, Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia uh, will definitely lead the recovery. Yeah. And um, so we, we've, we've got a slide here, which um, it, it sort of looks like a different topic, but actually it is in a way you've, you've all just been alluding to it. Um, and this is really what the impact of the conflict in Ukraine is on, on flying. And we, we saw this image um, a, a couple of weeks ago um, posted on social media, which is the routing for a BA um, Tokyo to London flight. And I believe it's going um, over the North Pole um, on the inbound to London route and it's going taking a southerly route um, in the other direction and, and the flight is about two hours longer than it used to be and this question of rerouting um, and the impact of not having overflight rights with Russia is um, is quite quite significant isn't it in this market John and I think that's what you were alluding to that actually if the Chinese airlines have phone flight rights or the Indian airlines, that puts them in quite a different position to the European airlines. Absolutely. I mean, you know, with Russian overflights, um, China was was a good 24 hour market. You know, it was great for aircraft integration um, back into a hub. Uh, you could get there and back in 24 hours. You could operate a consistent air uh, schedule. Um, it was it was an, a nice, easy route. Um, from that operational perspective. Now it has to head out um, for a further two hours and take, you know, some quite large detours. Um, it's completely mucked up uh, slots, uh, connectivity uh, and operating programs. And, and of course, four hours extra flying a day, you know, with the price of fuel at the moment is very expensive. Um, now, the European carriers are obviously impacted by this, and on some days you can see Finnair aircraft um, departing from Tokyo, Narita, and Haneda 
going in different directions over the North Pole, um, just depending on the currents at the time of day they go. Um, but the Chinese carriers mm -hmm. are just happily flying through Russian airspace um, and still able to operate within that 24-hour operating window. Um, and when there is a recovery, they'll have the advantage that that will, that that will give them. You know, they'll they'll be operating uh, with a lower cost base. Their operating costs were already lower because of their salaries uh, and their labour cost. Um, and mm -hmm. that's going to determine the price in the market, which for the European airlines is going to mean they'll be feeding either on the crumbs of, that are left on the table or um, on that passenger who's, who wants to fly with the European airline. Uh, it's it's going to linger into the summer there's no doubt about that and probably longer and i mean it's not just here julian you have air india flying over the north pole don't you at the moment yeah we in from an indian point of view this is actually quite a key um situation for us because we obviously have u.s carriers well we have united and american flying directly into uh, delhi um but obviously they can't overfly russia so Air India can, and therefore, as you were saying, there's about a two hour track benefit on that. Um, we also have airlines that you know, want to commence services to Hyderabad from the US because the market's so big, it's a huge market between Hyderabad and the US. But because of the, uh, the, the distance on that, it's another two hours flying further south than Delhi. None of the US carriers can make it work without flying over Russia from a range point of view. So. We have a market that people want to operate, can't do because of Russia uh, being closed at the moment. Um, however, Air India can. So Air India have that benefit. Uh, and what we're seeing then is, is now it's shaping some of Air India's strategy as they're looking. You know, John referenced earlier the huge uh, wide body order that they might be making and how they're going to deploy some of these aircraft. Um, and I think it's leading them to think of their North American strategy because they've got a real advantage here. Uh, and they're taking five aircraft from Delta to serve primarily the North American marketplace from India, and, and they really are going to have a benefit right now. We're losing a lot of traffic from, from Hyderabad through the Middle East to go to, to North America, and we still have volume, but from a passenger point of view, they want to fly direct. So that's impeding our potential to, to, to grow the North American market at Hyderabad, and it is also operationally impacting some of the guys in Delhi, because it's, it's that type of some of the ranges that we have to park um one of the us carriers right at the end of the pier so the taxi time to the air uh, to the runway is shorter uh, to enable them to operate you know within the uh, parameters so it, it's tight with russia being closed but, but yeah, we, we, we've shown at the bottom here um some of the the ba schedule but there's there's a few other flights as well going to tokyo and it's no longer possible to do this return in in 24 hours and so the whole sort of uh, timetabling and slots have have changed i think there's flights going out at one time on a, a tuesday thursday saturday and then the alternate days they're, they're using different times and, and so there's a knock-on effect isn't there in aircraft utilization um I, I think one of our guests this afternoon is talking about aircraft but because it's taking longer to fly some of these long routes actually aircraft are being pulled off other routes to make that possible um it, it's quite yeah. it's quite Sort of fundamental, isn't it, to the, to the way the airlines are operating? Some of the yeah, it's, it's the law of unintended consequences. I mean, the example that um, we'll hear more about this afternoon is um, relates to Sao Paulo, and they've lost services from United because United have got to have more aircraft to operate to India and other points because of the extended journey times, and they don't have the aircraft. So sometimes the knock-on effect actually isn't at the hub airport, but it's further down the line at the secondary market, you know, that, that has done nothing, but is, is just impacted about by the whole event. This is great for time travel, though, Becca. I mean, I, as I said yesterday, I'm doing uh, this uh, route in, uh, in late January. And, you know, first time I'm going to cross the international date line. But you can, you can, I think in about two hours, you can travel about eight time zones. Um, you know, it's, it's the nearest we'll get to sort of intergalactic travel. Um, I'm so glad I'm not travelling with you for that flight because well, you know, don't worry, I'm going to be asleep. You I'm, sound I'm like a kid in a, in a toy 15. shop. So excited! I think you're going to be jumping up and down on the plane, saying, "I've, I'm I've crossed the international dateline." And I, you know, I'm, that guy on the left, on the right-hand side of that image. I mean, you know, he's promised he'll be out waiting for me, so it's, uh, it's going to be a good trip. <laughs> 
Okay, we, we're going to have a look now at um, low cost sector, um, which when we look back over the last year, um, and again, if we compare to where we were um, three years ago before the pandemic, it's the low cost carriers that have gained market share, at least in terms of capacity, um, and I'm, I'm guessing almost certainly in terms of traffic. Um, so this chart here shows um, the capacity share for low cost carriers by each of the 14, um, 17 IATA regions. And mostly we can see that they have gained share across the regions. Um, that's not a surprise, is it, John? No, not at all. You know, uh, simple business model, point to point fly in, uh, <laughs> typically one, maybe two aircraft type maximum, uh, in many cases, multiple bases in different countries. Um, you know, they tick all of the necessary boxes to have recovered quicker. No complex aircraft integrations like we've just been talking about and all of those sort of things. Um, and in some markets, you just see the legacy carriers almost giving up, you know, particularly in the short haul and the domestic territory. Um, they just cannot compete on price or they're even handing over um, what was a legacy destination to a low cost partner or a lower cost partner. Uh, and I can I can see this happening. And, and as you say, it's going to grow. There are some some interesting things happening in North America. If you look at the, the planned aircraft orders for Spirit, Allegiant and Frontier for the next two or three years, you know, they're all getting more Airbus aircraft. Frontier have moved into Dallas and are building a base there. That's going to challenge America and we're going to see the same happening in Chicago, I'm sure, um, and probably other points as well. So you've got that dimension in North America. In the Middle East, you've got Fly Dubai, who are sort of a hybrid now, but Wiz. Um, in Abu Dhabi are growing their network. They've just opened a new route to Samarkand uh, yesterday. Um, and you've got Air Arabia, you've got the Saudi Route Development Fund, which seems to be attracting lots of low-cost um, activity. So I think there's there's a lot going on there. And you know, the one the one downside as you see here is in South Africa where um, the whole domestic market in South Africa has been, you know badly damaged um, South African Airways quite early in the whole pandemic, uh, then Comair. So um, yeah, but this is this is where a lot of the action is going to be. So don't forget to pack your sandwich when you uh, when you fly low cost. And I, th I think, I think to agree, it particularly with, to, with to North agree. America. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say to a point about what we're talking a bit later on, maybe about the amount of startups as well. New startup carriers are primarily focusing on being a low cost model. So you've got the, any sort of people emerging from the pandemic starting airlines in a low cost fashion. You've got low cost carriers who have been more resilient through the pandemic, who are now with some big order books. I mean, Indigo's got a huge order book, Lion Air's got a huge order book, and they've got growth aspirations. We've got new carriers starting like Akasa here in India with low cost as well. Um, and I think they've just risen, they've weathered the storm better in some places. I mean, not all, but in, in some of these big carriers have been quite robust throughout this pandemic. It, it, I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens at airports now because we used to, um, and maybe this is a bit of a dated view, you know, the low cost carriers were operating at generally different sorts of airports from the big hub carriers, but that's really breaking down now, isn't it? And we're not seeing a lot of low cost perhaps at Heathrow, but as you say, in the um, the US airports, there's significant low cost share now at quite a lot of the big US hub airports, aren't there? Yeah, and you know, not just not just in North America. I mean, Heathrow is probably the exception to the rule. Amsterdam Schiphol has a large uh, large share of low cost. Every major European airport, Lisbon, Madrid, Paris, Charles de Gaulle, um, you know, they've all got large shares. It's the same in Scandinavia. So I think I think um, airports have learned to develop both markets uh, in parallel. Um, and obviously, the low cost market is much more fickle, as we know. You know, if a route doesn't work, they'll close it. They'll move on and try something else. We see more churn. Um, but it means airports have got to be more agile in the, in the way they respond and um, it's going to be fascinating to see how low cost develops in, in regional markets like um, Central Asia, for instance, where you know there's a very small share of low cost activity at the moment, but you've got large emergent market, you've got new airports, you've got airports now behaving like commercial operations um, and, it, and it's ripe for growth. Um, yeah. And, and you know, there's 
big big markets like India literally within two hours flying time if you look at you draw a, a range circle from some of the Indian markets within four and five hours that will be interesting and, and yesterday I saw Airbus had an um, A321 XLR in the sky for 17 hours in Europe flying around um, doing different things it went from Toulouse to Dublin then up to Scandinavia then over um, all the way over to Poland then down to southern Europe and eventually got back to Toulouse 17 hours later when they get established in the market and operators get them it's not just going to be you know the classic two three four hour sectors but the transatlantic markets the Middle East markets are going to be ripe for um, low-cost long-haul and, and when we look at this There's table, the, the, the two lines, the bars that, that are highest are the South Asia and Southeast Asia. So um, we've pulled out um, three of the bigger markets in Southeast Asia um, and, and South Asia, India, Indonesia, and Thailand, just to have a look at which the airlines are, because they there's some really, you mentioned Indigo um, already, Julian, um, almost 50% share of, of the Indian market in terms of capacity in December. Yeah, and Indigo is huge, and as I say, it's got a you know an order book in the hundreds as well. Um, included in that, to that earlier point, is some of the A321 XLRs as well. So I mean, they're looking at getting into that longer haul market. They're exploring international operations. They're currently working you know, with building their code share partnerships as well. So while they're a low cost carrier. You know, they're very strict on their cost base. They have a low cost operation, high turnarounds, rapid turnarounds. You know, you're you're queuing to get on the aircraft, watching people getting off it. You know, they really are very uh, rigorous in their approach. Um, so they tick all the boxes and they have good market share. And I think a part of that is not only scale, but also reputation. As an airline, Indigo is very strong in its offering. You know, they are very reliable. They are well known for that. And yes, they're low cost, but they are they are very capable in that regard. So I think their aspirations are very much to continue growing. And it's going to be fascinating to see how that plays out with the new Air India, because the new Air India is going to be this full service, bigger carrier, domestic and international mix. But you've got Indigo with primarily the vast market share in terms of the domestic market at the moment. Um, but Indigo is even now beginning to experiment in wide bodies through leasing some. Uh, looking flying and flying into Istanbul, for example, and connecting onwards. So we can talk about low cost and full service, but there's still that blur, and there always will be, I think, um, in terms of the models. And and then the low cost market, you know, not to dominate on India, but it does suit India quite well because it is quite a low yield market. You know, a lot of the fares are quite lower pricing, so actually having a low cost base is pretty important. Don't you? It's quite. Um, I was smiling. Um, I read, a, read an interview where uh, Scott Kirby, the CEO of United Airlines, described air, uh, low-cost airlines as nothing more than a Ponzi. Um, well, you know, if, if this is a Ponzi, give me a share of it. You know, this is this is where the market is going to be, and it's it's almost like a Canute statement, isn't it? Where you you know you can't compete, you haven't got the cost base, therefore you you shout out the competition as being something that it isn't, because you you want to turn attention away from your problems. Yeah, and I can concur with Julian when you said that low-cost carriers suit the Indian market. They really suit the Southeast Asian market very, very perfectly, really. And if you go back, and I don't want to talk too much about 2019, um, Becca, but if you go back to 2019, the thing that really drove intra-regional travel, travel growth during the, the latter mm -hmm. part of the 2010s was the frequency of travel. It wasn't that more people were traveling, it was that more people were traveling more often. And that was driven by low-cost carriers. And if you look at those figures, for, for this year where the recovery is actually happening so you look at thailand you look at indonesia but you look at a couple of the markets that are struggling at the moment and that's vietnam and malaysia and that's where we haven't really seen the low cost capacities really delivering uh, the same results that they were in 2019 and you know going into 2023 this will be an important aspect of intra asean travel will be how quickly um, the, the low cost carriers can not only increase their capacities but their frequencies it was the, it was the flight frequencies that drove travel in, in the region yeah, and I was looking at some China data yesterday that we, we haven't shown here, but, you know, the, the airline that's grown most is Spring Airlines, which is mm. um, is low cost, isn't it, in China? Um, so, you know, if China was a low cost market, you know, it has lots of potential as well if the low cost carriers um, had, had more of a foothold there. 
Yeah, that yeah, golden. They'll be licking their lips when Japan reopens as well, because spring has yeah. strong connections with Japan. Yeah. Yeah, that golden triangle of uh, South Korea, Japan, and China is completely ripe for low cost airlines. You know, South Koreans have got them in abundance, probably too many. Um, Japan really isn't yet um, into an established low cost carrier. They've got Skymark and a couple of others, uh, Peach. But you know they're not they're not really significant players in the market. It's still controlled by ANA and Japan Airlines, uh, and in China, as we said, Spring are the only one who's a really credible low cost carrier. That that has to change at some point, and when it changes, it, to Gary's point, you know, allowing for the frequency of travel you would expect to see, it's going to be a really really big opportunity. Yeah. So we've got a really interesting, um, well, we think it's an interesting piece of analysis now, um, not, not in Asia Pacific, but looking at Ryanair in Europe. Um, and what we've done here is looked over the last year at the number of routes that they operate on a week by week basis, uh, a month by month basis, and looked at what routes were not operated in one month that had been the previous month, or that had been started that weren't operated the previous month, just to show the level of um, churn of routes at Ryanair and this may be exceptional and it may play to what John was speaking about earlier about um, that sort of seasonality that we see in Europe but it is um, it's a it's a lot of change isn't it there John? Oh it's, it's brutal I mean you know it's a, there are and we see it in the, in the weekly uh, blogs and the data that we put out on a Monday or a Tuesday um, you know between the end of September through to about now, the whole global market sort of drifts down from 102, 103 million down to 89 million seats a week, all of which is on the basis of these destinations being dropped and primarily low cost, but also legacy airlines easing back on their utilization and their productivity for about a two month period. And there'll be a bit of a pickup now for Christmas and then the ski season will start. Um, but it's, it's dramatic. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's bizarre some of the, the unintended consequences. I mean, I know engineering and MRO companies in Europe that are absolutely full and their schedules are completely jammed with maintenance work from now through to the end of April and May on aircraft for Ryanair and EasyJet and other low cost carriers who've really worked their aircraft hard through the summer and now have downtime and need to do all of the relevant checks and, and overhauls. And Julian, when you were at Manchester, I mean, your airport saw this as much as anyone else. You know, charter carriers, low cost carriers, you just, your runways and your taxiways look empty in the first week of November, don't they? Yeah, I and mean, you can see the seasonality playing out here very strongly because those big orange reductions basically mark the end of the summer season. And then the big blue, like the biggest blue increases, but mark the start, the start of the sun season. So you can see that. And it comes back to that point you were making earlier about the overall problem we have with just general global seasonality, which is particularly prevalent in Europe, um, creates that inability to get efficiencies through the winter. And it makes winter quite challenging at times. Um, and yeah, we, 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 we've seen that a lot. The, the fluctuations within is... Uh, is always interesting though because I think it shows that airlines or Ryanair in this example are being quite um, ruthless maybe the wrong word but certainly quite strong in terms of their uh, taking action on routes whether to cut them or, or add them depending on market opportunity so it gives airports a, a focus point in terms of how do we manage our uh, relationships with these airlines in terms of understanding what their intentions are and how best to work with them to keep them um, because you wouldn't want to be an airport that set yourself up and suddenly find that Ryanair drops a load of routes on you. So behind the scenes in terms of contracting and, and, and pieces with airlines is, is important in this. But it, that to me really just demonstrates that seasonality point. And I, I think as well, going to the point, Julian, I, th I think what it also shows that there, is that there's opportunities for airports that because there is a churn of routes taking place, um, some of these airlines are always looking at where they could be flying. And so it, there are opportunities. Yeah, it's not, it's yeah. not a static it, thing to schedule. No, it's it the, shows that competitive point. The shoulders Cause, cause we are in a very competitive environment. You know, as, as airports, we are competing, you know, domestically and sorry, short haul. You know, in Europe, airports are competing for people like Ryanair. You know, here in India, we're competing with airlines across the globe for long haul services. So I think, you know, that, 
there's always that assumption that airports and airlines it all gets on and airlines will just choose to fly but we are really in a competitive world here where we're trying to re get airlines to rebuild their networks to our airports um, and it's not just going to come you know we have to be out there we have to be on the road we have to be in front of these people and we have to convince them the potential so i think coming out of the pandemic to one of the stories about what's what's new what's coming out of what's the learnings from it it's about the fact that we have to rebuild and we have to really compete to rebuild and, and reconvince airlines of the potential because they're the guys who've you know suffered a lot they've lost a lot of money through it and they're being very cautious as they rebuild now and, and this slide shows the caution and the attention to detail here now so we've got to really work with them to, to sort of support their cases to, to rebuild again the important i think back to the important thing is this is you know this is not an issue purely for the airports this is an issue for the stakeholders the communities and the economic wealth in these um communities mm -hmm. And one of the great challenges is, is to get some of that activity to extend into the shoulder season uh, and even into the off peak season. And, you know, some of the southern Mediterranean destinations, classically, you know, Greek hoteliers close at the end of October and they don't want to see anyone until April. Um, but then I was um, participating in a webinar um, with um, the Cyprus Tourism Board and um, their airports, and they were saying, They've actually invested money in creating Christmas markets or Christmas villages in Cyprus, where they've actually given funding to communities in villages to create a, you know, a Mediterranean Christmas destination to try and encourage off-peak travel and fill those um, seats and operators that are, are, have stayed in the market. So if you want to stay in these into the shoulder period, it's not just about the airport talking to the airline, it's about the whole community putting a product together that is you know, marketable, understands who it's talking to, and knows it's a community that will travel. You, know, you can't sell sun um, in November to you know, Italy, it just doesn't exist. But if you have food markets, you have walking holidays and things like that, things change. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah. can I just add quickly, Becca, that the, um, the, the issue of seasonality in Southeast Asia sometimes gets a little bit underrated because essentially it's not seasons, there's, there's monsoon and there's dry season, but it's always hot. Yeah. But a lot of the markets that we're now seeing that are opening again, Northeast Asia, Japan, Taiwan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, they do have seasons. And the travel patterns from Southeast Asia to those destinations do follow seasonal patterns. If you talk to uh, Tourism Australia, for example, they will tell you that travel from Malaysia and Singapore is quite strong during their down season, during their winter, because that's actually when uh, those tourists like to go to those destinations. The same with uh, with Japan to go for the ski season. So there is an element of seasonality in the Southeast, Southeast Asian outbound market, which you don't get on the inbound market. Yeah, very interesting, very interesting. Okay, one of the topics we come back to again and again in these webinars is why we haven't seen more airline failures. And what we've done um, here is just, um, counted the number of airlines that we're seeing, uh, scheduled airlines that we're seeing operating in each of these regions um, and how many more or less that is than um, three years ago. So these are December numbers. And we put a bit of a threshold on there because um, you know there's an awful lot of very, very small airlines. So we've just done a threshold of, of they've got to be off operating five or more in a month. Um, so this is December data very large numbers i know gary you were you were quite excited to see this and I, the, the the thing that strikes me always when we look at airline numbers is just how many airlines there are that you know the idea that there's over 400 in europe um, you know 400 scheduled airlines just um it's such a lot of airlines really um yeah i mean i'm i'm, I'm a sucker for colors for graphs and for maps <laughs> and uh, i give a lot of presentations in asia pacific region if you put this one up on the screen i know that it will be photographed and, and shared on on social media pretty quickly uh, it, it's a great representation of the, the situation where it is right now i mean living in asia you know 480 airlines is a lot but then you look at the the deficit um and, and you know you just look that just shows you how the market is still catching up that's something that uh, to me really really stands out from this i don't know what you john and, and julian you pick out from it I just despair at this because um, you look at this and you hear a, a, it was the IATA open day last week and you know they were saying that they expect the industry to be profitable next year at a global level uh, and then when they break it down 
most of the profit's going to come from North America. Actually, it's going to come from five or six airlines at best. Um, then there's going to be a smattering of European carriers like Ryanair, EasyJet, um, probably IAG, and a few others that will make a profit, and a couple in the Middle East will make a profit uh, because they always do. Um, and you know, in Southeast Asia, Singapore Airlines will make a profit because they always do. Um, but the reality is, probably no more than 20 airlines will be successfully profitable um, next year around the globe. And then all the rest of these are unprofitable. Um, and that's going to be at a moment in time when demand will be really strong, you know, will be full on recovery, will have capacity discipline. It's We've got too many airlines. We have far too many airlines in the world um, operating suboptimal networks, not able to achieve scale, vulnerable to the swings and fortunes of economic policy, recession, corporate demand, etc. It's a it's a struggle being an airline CEO, isn't it, Julian? <laughs> yeah, certainly is. I um I agree. It, it's it's amazing to see regardless of the numbers on this page that there is still a huge appetite to start carriers up uh, and i i'm you know, we've we've got a few that you know we, we're close to in a certain way with the casa having just started with jet airways 2.0 hopefully starting soon uh fly pop you know out of the uk which has yet to actually start its scheduled services but they're intending to uh even though they're operating in a charter and, and cargo capacity so there's a number out there and there's, there's big names that everybody will know about north atlantic for example there's this new fly atlantic concept you know hubbing through belfast which is on the horizon so there's a variety of different carriers and i'm not going to criticize or, or or any particular model but it's more the principle that yeah i'm surprised as well how much still trying to get into this market and everybody believes they have their own unique proposition you know i wish them all the best i really do and i hope they all survive but it's a tough world. It's a very yeah. tough environment, and uh, you know the carriers that are established with big cost, big sort of big scale already are struggling in certain ways. So I, you know, I, I I hope a lot of these will work, uh, yeah. but it's going to be difficult. I, it's it's one of the favourite lines when you talk to a new airline. Um, their opening gambit is "We're different because," and um, when you hear it, it's no different to anyone else. You know, it's, it's yeah. got two engines, it's got a wings, and it's got someone at the front. Um, and it will have a lower cost yeah. base to begin with. Um, but unless it can continue to grow and grow and grow, through a comment by Scott Kirby about Ponzi's, you know, until you achieve ma that critical mass point, which can be a long way away, it's very hard to find something that will work and be sustainable. Yeah. And, and, and Becca, just one example, I mean, you know, Etihad are bringing back the A380, um, something they said they would never, never, never do. But for it even to be operationally effective, they have to bring back four A380s because otherwise you can't get the crew utilisation, you can't get the hours, you can't get the performance, you can't even begin to be cost effective. So, you know, think of what they're going to, the investment they're making to bring that aircraft. That, I mean, we haven't talked about aircraft um so far but you know is that because we know that aircraft are are constrained as a resource at the moment that you know for, for all that we've had some big orders take place you know yesterday i know united announced a, a large uh, a large aircraft order but there's not enough aircraft to go around at the moment are there so they've got to bring back some of the older aircraft yeah and it's and it's about you know the connectivity through abu, abu dhabi and feeding the rest of their network and and all of the, the things they need to be doing there so so that's important um but the a380 was was a dead duck two and a half years ago everyone couldn't get rid of it quick enough now everyone wants it back Lufthansa's flight back to frankfurt you know it's flying on their network from the summer um emirates were the only people who stuck with the aircraft maybe they got the call right maybe they were right all the way through i think etihad may be a different example um, because they've got a new management team now. So their new CEO has gone in and their strategy is changing. So Tony, you know, the previous CEO had a, had a strategy of consolidation and really focus on what worked and, and, and narrow it down a bit. Whereas the new CEO has issued quite a growth mandate again. 
uh, and looking into market growth and expansion and trying to reposition. And Abu Dhabi as a, as a, as a Emirati is very keen to try and explore itself as a big hub. So it, it could be linked into that. I don't know, but it could be linked into this new aspiration to try and get back out there and be prestigious and grow again. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. Okay. Um, just a couple more slides left. Um, as we look forward to 2023, 20, uh, um, there's a lot of a lot of challenges on the horizon, aren't there? I know certainly in the UK we are facing high cost of living. You know, people's budgets are pretty constrained. Um, recession potentially on the horizon. Um, all sorts of adverse economic factors taking place. So, how is that going to play out? in 2023 for aviation? Oh. I, I, I'm an optimist about 2023. I think it will um, continue to be strong. If we get through the first quarter um, and we don't have any hiccups... If we do, you, you think we might not? <laughs> well, you know, inevitably we will get through, but it's, it's, it's how, much, how much blood is spilt on the carpet in the first quarter, really. Um, but I, I, you know, I think demand is still going to be strong. In Europe, um, you know, our holidays have become part of our, our DNA and, and I think it's, it's going to take a lot more than what we've seen so far for people to for, forsake those. It does play towards more of the low cost travel that we've, that we've been talking about. Um, and in the emergent markets, Gary's been speaking about, you know, how much scope there is for further growth in, in, South, in Asia in the next, next year and China reopening. Um, and as long as we have capacity discipline, uh, I think you know the market will perform relatively well. I mean, Julian's sitting in in the fastest growing market in the world, which has overtaken China from my perspective as the place to be for aviation for the next couple of years. Um, it's whatever way you look at it, Becca. You know, very few of us can walk on water, and I'm not going to tell you where the stepping stones are. So until you find out the answer, you're going to have to fly to get to your destination. Yeah, I, uh, I'm just, I agree, uh, and I am sitting in the most exciting place in in aviation, I think, at the moment. We, you know, we are we're even opening new airports, huge developments. We are. Oh, we've just we've not, just had our new airport. In, our new Goa airport was inaugurated by the Prime Minister on Sunday. I was there and we will open for our schedule of operations from the 5th of January. So a brand new airport. We're doing significant expansion in Hyderabad and that's opening with new facilities. Delhi, we're in the middle of developing one of our terminals, which will be capacity of 40 million. So it's an airport in its own right. So yeah, huge, huge growth. And we've got other things on the horizon as well. It's not just those. Um, so India as a market is growing overall. And, and in terms of overall, I share the optimism. I think people want to travel and, and that whole, oh, we're not going to travel, we'll do everything on screen anymore. I, I just don't think that happens. I think there's a degree of account management you can do over a screen, but getting out there in person from a business point of view is unbeatable. And people still want to go on the holidays. People still want to travel to wherever you know, to get the sun and, and, and other things and see things, particularly after having been locked up for a few years. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic and with all the developments that are going on, particularly in this market with Air India, with Indigo, I think there's a huge platform there for, for growth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. I think from the Asia Pacific perspective, it's been 2022 has been a sort of dress rehearsal year. We've had a very compressed and very condensed year because Southeast Asian markets didn't really open till the second quarter. Northeast Asian markets didn't really open until the fourth quarter. So there is still a lot, I know it's a bit of a cliche, but there is still a lot of pent, pent up demand to be released of travel. I'm pretty strong on uh, intra-regional travel next year. I think there'll be a lot of North, Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia travel. I think Australia will do quite well. China's coming back. So I think the Asian region could actually start to catch up a little bit because it is such a long way behind. Um, simply because of the lag in time. It didn't It didn't reopen for the summer seasons in 2020 and 2021 like you had in Europe and North America. So we had a complete shutout for two years and it's, you know, the impacts of that are still being felt. But 2023 is a year where Asia could could start to, to catch up. There are these global headwinds and I know that there is, uh, there is quite strong sentiment in the US market, for example, that the, as John said, that the first quarter could be a bit down. We have weaker currencies in, in our region as well. Not too sure about price elasticity. It's it's still a very, very price sensitive region and airfares are still high. I'm not sure what your, your view on longer term about airfares, John. 
uh, discipline um, all about capacity <laughs> management, I think, Gary, as long as there is, you know, we see that continued sort of cautious approach from the airlines. Uh, I think fares, high fares uh, are likely to be around for the whole of 2023 and going into 24. Um, airlines, airlines are in no rush to, you know, go out and try and stimulate markets when they haven't got capacity. Um, there's no value in doing that. And yeah. I think as and when the, the sort of the resourcing issues are resolved, then the temptation will be to go back to what they used to do and add capacity, you know, perhaps faster than they should. And then, you know, as, as John says, we lose the capacity discipline and then the fares start to come down. Um, so I'd, I'd, it'd be nice to think this is uh, what we're seeing now is a, a result of, of planned behaviour, but I think it's the result of resource constraints, which means they can't grow as fast as they might like to. Yeah, I agree. I think 2023 could... is a progressive recovery. I don't think it's going to be a dynamic recovery in Asia Pacific, but I think it'll be a progressive recovery. Yeah, and I was just going to say, I think that that plays forward. It's the whole operational, you know, supply chain issues <laughs> with engines, with fleet, it's still going to play a factor and it could curtail some of that potential. But I think the underlying demand is pretty strong. Yeah, yeah. And and that's good because then there is the ability to keep the fares high as well for, for a while longer. We've got one more slide to finish with, which is uh, supposed to be a bit more fun, but there was a serious point as well. So OAG uh, produces um, graphics that go out on Twitter that are sort of dynamic and, and people quite like those. Um, we put some data together for them for this one, looking at the scheduled flight arrivals at the four main airports used for people going to Lapland to see Santa Claus. And what surprised us here was just how long the Santa Claus season was. Um, it goes right through to the end of March. Um, so aside from being a sort of a fun point, it, it really shows that, you know, we were talking earlier about being able to extend the shoulder season or extend a season. If ever there was a market I thought that perhaps was time limited, um, you know, you go to see Santa at Christmas, actually, this is a destination that succeeded in making um, the season pretty long um, and going beyond that. So it just uh, highlights really where the opportunities are. Um, and you can see, well, firstly, Becca, you know, I'm staggered. You, so you still believe in Father Christmas, obviously. <laughs> Absolutely. But, yeah, but you know, you can even see within here. You don't, John, you don't. No, no. Unfortunately, my bank account confirms <laughs> I don't. Um, you can see the half-term holiday in, in Europe, um, the weeks of 19th and 24th of February here, where you, you see that even within that, you know, creation of a shoulder season, there is a spike there. Um, and that plays to this whole thing about all the spare capacity there is in Western Europe at this moment in time. You know, this is opportunistic, creative flying, great for the airlines, great for the destination. Um, and not very good for the parents' pockets, I can assure you. <laughs> we were looking at this uh, yesterday, weren't we, Becca? And I, I pointed out that uh, Rob and Niemi, it, it, it markets very strongly into the Asia Pacific region, the, the annual ITB Asia, the biggest trade show in, in Asia Pacific, uh, in Singapore every year. Uh, Rob and Niemi has a huge stand and they have been doing for a few years. This isn't just uh, post pandemic. They, yeah. they have uh, since about 2015, 2016. Um, and they must be doing quite well out of doing that because they they spend quite a lot of money on that that roadshow uh, booth that they have. It used, yeah, to be, it used to be a really good market for thin air um, with connectivity straight up um, from all of their Asian destinations. Not so great now, of course, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah, really interesting. Okay, that uh, that finishes our slides for today. We will be um, sending out after this um, to any of you who've registered. Um, I think uh, OAG is going to be sending out a survey. Just It's just got one or two questions. If you've got ideas for topics we should cover in 2023, uh, that's your opportunity. Um, we generally keep these webinars, we've been going for what, nearly three years, haven't we, John? Um, yeah, focused on OEG data and capacity in particular, trying to understand the trends that are happening around the world. But OEG gets involved with lots of other topics, travel tech, distribution, passenger experience, all sorts of things. And so we're interested to see um, what other topics um, people would like us to be talking about in webinars over the next year. 
Um, so please have a look for that and, uh, and fill that in. And if you're a budding contributor to our webinars and you, you sit each month thinking, oh, I wish I could have my say, then again, that's your opportunity to let us know. We, we would be interested to find a few more people who, who want to come on and, and share their experience, who, who understand what we're trying to do here. That would be great. Um, any final words from um, you, John, Gary, Julian? We really appreciate your time and your insights today, but if there's anything you, uh, you feel you haven't had a chance to say, then um, this is your opportunity. Uh, no, um, just wish everyone a happy Christmas. More prosperous New Year than it was in 2022, and uh, look forward to talking about the industry in uh, January. Yeah, I would agree. I think uh, happy Christmas to everybody. Happy New Year. I think looking back from the Asia Pacific viewpoint, 12 months to where we were this time last year to where we are this year, we, we have to be happy. We have to be uh, happy. Uh, I think we may just have lost Julian at the, uh, the end of this. I think you might be able to hear me. I think I just cut oh. out for a while and my camera's stopped working, but <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Oh, there we go. I'm back again. Great. Well, thank you very much. And it seems that all three of you are are quite positive about demand as we go forward and the ability of the industry to respond to that demand. So that's a, a good way to end. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. All right. Thank you. Bye. 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 We'll be back on January the 18th. So uh, pop that date in your diary. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Then. Bye.